So who gets to keep an engagement ring if the wedding is called off? Well, that is what the woman gets humbled after court orders her to return a $70,000 engagement ring to her ex-fiance. We'll break down what led to the court's decision, her reaction, and why this case has everyone talking. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more stories that keep you thinking. Let's dive in. This is exactly why I say never accept a coffee date. Look at what this man said. Um, the blunt and, might I add, very honest truth. But it's okay. I do understand. The truth has actually been found to hurt many an individual's feelings over the years. When a man invites you out for a coffee on a first date, he's essentially asking to prove herself to him. When did the disconnect in reality actually occur? When many an individual out there actually seem to lose the understanding of the entire purpose of a first date. A first date is to get to know one another. Because he think he's the price we won over. He's giving you bare minimum. Just my opinion, but any person that tries to judge the value of another person based on how much they spend on a first date, probably isn't worth dating. Let's be honest, for a woman to go on a date, you gotta do your makeup, do your hair, spend some time to look presentable, right? And a great many women do that every single day, just to go to the store, but continue. But men can just hop out of the shower and come out. And believe me, men know that. I think a lot of women are jealous of that fact. So tell me, if you are a woman with the slightest sense of dignity and self-worth, would you really waste so much of your time to go out on a $5 coffee date with someone? Would you though? What some very materialistic individuals call dignity and self-worth, the rest of us have another word for. Here's the thing. The idea that a woman should never accept a coffee date is exactly the kind of entitlement that's turning modern dating into a circus. If someone can't appreciate the simplicity of a good conversation over a cup of coffee, then what are they even looking for? A date isn't about the venue. It's about the connection. Let's break this down. Coffee dates are low-pressure, genuine, and practical. They offer an opportunity to get to know someone without the distractions of over-the-top gestures or flashy environments. If the focus is supposed to be on the person, not the setting, why does it matter if you're sipping lattes or dining at a five-star restaurant? The answer, it doesn't. Unless, of course, the person is more interested in the experience than the individual. When someone turns their nose up at a coffee date, what they're really saying is, your time, effort, and intentions aren't good enough unless they come with a hefty price tag. And that's a huge red flag. Women who appreciate the simple things like meaningful conversation and shared time, are the ones worth investing in. The ones who scoff at coffee dates? They're chasing status, not substance. The truth is, coffee dates are a litmus test. If a woman can't find value in something as straightforward as a coffee date, she's probably not going to appreciate the deeper, more meaningful aspects of a relationship either. And honestly, why bother with someone who can't see the value in simplicity? Life isn't a rom-com, and relationships aren't built on extravagant first impressions. They're built on understanding, respect, and connection. At the end of the day, it's not about the coffee. It's about what it represents. Effort, interest, and the chance to get to know someone without pretense. If that's not good enough for her, then maybe it's time to find someone who can appreciate the real you. Without the bells and whistles. I can't chase women down, not because I'm better than them, or I have an ego, it's for my own mental health. We're in a new age, right? Where women have hyperabundance, meaning that we, they don't see guys as like, we're like fourth. I think for, for Zoomer women, we're like seventh most important. And for women past the wall, or we're like fourth most important priority, right? We're not as important as we think we are to women, right? If women do not show me that they don't care about being in relationships, right? Then why would I chase them down? I've had women that, you know, offer to take care of my, my puppy, right? Almost lose him, almost get him killed, and then hand him over to me and say, hey, uh, sorry about your dog, and then laugh and say, I can't see you anymore. I'm seeing another guy. And then, like, and then a week before that, we were holding hands at a coffee shop. A lot of men are trying their best and have tried their whole lives to be in the top so they can get a wife and kids. And guess what? Women still are not asking for relationships. I can promise you, you can't see this and I don't blame you because you don't date women, right? But I can promise you, most men are feeling this kind of phenomenon where it isn't until they absolutely have to 
women will not settle. We created this. We are the ones that throw money at women. We create gold diggers. We create whatever, right? Because we create the market. I get that, right? But those are your choices. And that's why women are single because here's the number one thing they have to adhere to men's expectations. Michaela, he's not saying all women take it, but we have a lot of advantages just from being women that we don't even realize the thing he's talking about when I was 22 and 23 and I was at work and I got special treatment. I thought it was because I was talented and because I worked hard in hindsight, it was probably because I was a woman. There's a lot of special treatment that the world gives you, especially when you're a single woman. Would you not say that's true? You get it. Male friends. Yeah. Okay. And even if you're not accepting the sugar baby stuff, you would still say you get free attention, right? And free perks. Sure. Men, men are throwing so much free stuff at women that some women don't even know they're sugar babies. Here's the thing. The math just doesn't add up anymore. Men are realizing that the reward of modern dating isn't worth the risk. Why? Because the expectations are through the roof and the reciprocity? Practically non-existent. Women are out here demanding high-maintenance lifestyles, yet they can't even maintain it for themselves. Make it make sense. Men aren't chasing women down anymore because they've woken up to the game. Why should a man break his back meeting a laundry list of demands? Six figures, six feet, six-pack abs, only to end up being treated like an option. It's exhausting and, frankly, not worth the headache. If she can't provide what she's asking for, then why is she asking? This isn't about not wanting to provide or spoil someone. It's about fairness. Men are tired of being seen as walking wallets where love and effort take a back seat to material gain. The reality is, a relationship should be a partnership, not a one-sided transaction where one person reaps all the benefits while the other constantly gives. And let's be honest. If someone can't provide their own, high-maintenance lifestyle, what they're really saying is they want someone else to fund their aspirations. That's not a partnership, that's dependency. A man isn't a life upgrade. And treating him like one is the fastest way to send him packing. The truth is, men are stepping back because they've seen through the facade. They're not bitter. They're just wise. If the risk of being used, undervalued, or disrespected outweighs the potential of finding a genuine connection, then the logical choice is to bow out of the game. So, here's a tip for anyone with sky-high expectations. Match the energy you're asking for. Provide what you're demanding. Because men are no longer signing up for relationships that feel more like contracts with no payoff. They're choosing peace over performance, and honestly, can you blame them? I am going to speak directly to males here and say these are the type of males that will make women not want to date any males anymore. These are the type of males that your daughter could run into one day. These are the type of males that women you love in your life or will love in the future, unfortunately have to deal with. So they're not talking just about me, about other women. They are talking about your daughters, your sisters, your mothers, your aunties, your cousins, women that you love in your life. These males are the reason there's a 4B movement. These kind of males are the reason women don't want to birth your children anymore. These kind of males are the reason that women don't want to raise your children anymore. These kind of males are the reason why women don't want to marry you anymore. These kind of males are the reason why women don't want to especially have daughters anymore. Here's the thing. The double standard is glaring and men have had enough of it. When women refuse to settle, they're applauded for knowing their worth. But when men hold their own standards and don't settle for less, suddenly, they're labeled as misogynistic. Funny how that works, isn't it? Let's be real. Why would men go for women who are 30 plus and still think they're God's gift to humanity, acting like their past doesn't matter? These are the same women who spent their prime years chasing the so-called bad boys, dismissing the good men, and now expect those same good men to show up and play hero. Newsflash, we don't want them. And no, they don't get to say they don't want us first. Men have already made their choice loud and clear. Here's the hard truth. Men don't have to accept the take-me-as-I-am narrative when it comes with a list of demands longer than a grocery receipt. If a man's standards disqualify her, it's not misogyny. It's called having boundaries. Men have wised up to the entitlement and games, 
and they're walking away from it. The modern dating market isn't what it used to be. Men are no longer lining up for women who dismiss them for years and then expect them to come running when the clock starts ticking. And let's be honest, if she spent her 20s playing the field and living carefree, she can't turn around and demand the world from a man in her 30s. It's just not realistic. At the end of the day, men are tired of being shamed for knowing what they want. Women can have their preferences, but men are just as entitled to theirs. So, let's stop pretending that only one side is allowed to have standards. The days of men being guilted into accepting less than they deserve are over. Period. Women will always tell men that they want them to open up about their issues. But whenever men open up about their issues, women fire back and say that it's not a problem. Millions of men across the country and even from other countries around the world have said that marriage is a bad deal for men, modern women are not wives, and that divorce court is stacked against them. And instead of saying, you know what, that's a terrible problem and listening to the men, what I see women tend to do is gaslight them and say that these problems are not real. Most men in this country suffer in silence. Men are not ones that have a tendency to complain. So when men say that the court system is completely stacked against them and millions of men say that they could not get custody of their children, we reveal our true nature when we come out and we don't believe them. Here's the thing. Opening up to the wrong woman is like handing her ammunition for future attacks. Many men have learned this lesson the hard way, and now they're wising up. The idea of marriage, a sacred vow, a lifelong commitment, is no longer what it used to be. Today, marriage feels more like a gamble where the odds are stacked against men. Let's look at the facts. 80% of divorces are initiated by women. That's a staggering statistic that tells you where the commitment lies, or rather, where it doesn't. Marriage, at its core, is supposed to be a vow before God, a promise of, till death do us part, no matter the challenges. But too often, that vow is treated like a suggestion instead of a sacred bond. Men are starting to see that marriage isn't a guarantee of loyalty or partnership anymore. These days, it seems like women are more committed to their own happiness and convenience than to the vows they make. If something doesn't feel right for them, whether it's financial troubles, emotional struggles, or just plain boredom, they're out the door and the man is left picking up the pieces. And let's not ignore the divorce courts, which seem designed to punish men. Between alimony, child support, and losing half of what they've worked hard for. It's no wonder so many men are saying, marriage? No, thank you. It's just not worth the risk when there's so little to gain and so much to lose. Here's the truth. Men want loyalty, respect, and genuine commitment. But too many women today seem unwilling or unable to provide that. Instead, they chase after unrealistic expectations and ideals, then blame men when things don't work out. It's exhausting and men are choosing peace over the constant drama. Marriage isn't the institution it used to be, and unless women start valuing it as much as men once did, more and more men will continue to walk away from it entirely. After all, why sign up for a system that doesn't honor its promises? The risk isn't worth the reward. What you are saying is that a man who puts on a dress, puts on a wig, chops his body up, calls himself a woman, is actually a woman. And I just don't see how you could believe that that is true. She has a shit probably tighter than mine. Double D racks, hair down to the ass, looks like a woman, talks like a woman, does everything besides menstruate and can give birth. What is separating her between the woman who are infertile, who can't have birth, or a woman no. after menopause, or the woman who never get their period? So are they not women either? Physically speaking, one, those are pretty big differences. And there are other differences too in terms of their bone density and the shape of the Oh skeleton. yeah, because you're so, gonna, yeah. But, but also, there's the chromosomal differences, <laughs> which is that that woman, as you call it, still uh, chromosomally is a man. And then beyond that, are you actually saying that women are just their well, bodies? Are you saying a woman is just her chromosome? Here's the thing. It's mind-boggling that some women are not only okay with this, but are actively supporting it while simultaneously crying about women's rights being under threat. It's the ultimate contradiction. Women are out here fighting for equality, fairness, and acknowledgement. Yet some are perfectly fine with the idea of reducing womanhood to something that can be worn 
like a costume. Let's be real, being a woman is not something you can simply decide to become one day. It's rooted in biology, experience, and the unique struggles that come with it. If you don't have the natural ability to menstruate, carry ovaries, or bring life into the world, you're not a woman. Period. Womanhood isn't something that can be fabricated, performed, or identified into. It's a lived reality, one that comes with its own set of joys, pains, and challenges that can't be mimicked, no matter how hard someone tries. This whole narrative is mocking what it truly means to be a woman. It's as if womanhood has been reduced to makeup, dresses, and stereotypes, a shallow caricature of what being a woman actually entails. Imagine dedicating your life to advocating for women's rights only to have the concept of woman itself devalued into something that anyone can claim without having lived the reality. The saying goes, just because you draw a line on a squash doesn't make it a watermelon. It doesn't matter how much you paint it, reshape it, or try to convince others otherwise, a squash remains a squash. Similarly, it doesn't matter how much someone changes their appearance, adopts mannerisms, or demands recognition. If they weren't born as a woman, they don't have the lived experience of one, and they never will. It's not about hate or exclusion. It's about preserving the meaning of what it is to be a woman. If the lines keep being blurred, then what's left of the rights and identity women have fought so hard to achieve? At some point, women need to stand up and say enough is enough. Womanhood isn't a costume, and it's not up for redefinition. It's time to stop pandering to ideologies that erase what it truly means to be a woman. Never, ever, ever build a woman, my brothers. And I'm going to tell you why. Now, back in the days I was working outside London, yeah? So it would have been Maidenhead. So it's basically concierge. But it was like a team of us. And I was the youngest of the group, yeah? So at this age, I never used to respect money. It was during COVID. So everyone's indoors. I was making like two bags a month, innit? So I was just blowing my money on smoking loud, food, clothes, dates, just foolishness. And not even proper dates, just going to girls' yards and ordering food, yeah? So cool. There was an old Nigerian man I used to work with called Yusuf. And I used to call him Mr. Yusuf out of respect, innit? So anyways, when I say this guy was a worker, so I used to work the 12-hour shifts, but he was working like... 24 hours back to back overtime all the shifts and i said to myself why does this guy work so much and he always used to say to me save your money save your money get a house i said no i ain't got time for that bro these times here i had a girl in maidenhead and she had her own yard so can you imagine the movie i'm living i used to go see her during my lunch breaks Please, brother i'm living my movie i ain't got time to save my money that's my mentality cool so anyways one day I stopped seeing Mr. Yusuf. And when I say this guy's to work hard, bro, to the point I used to say to him, who is this for? What is all of this for? And he said, oh, it's for my family. It's for my family. So I said, you know what? Cool. That makes a lot of sense. So one day I never saw Mr. Yusuf again. And I said to the others, yo, what happened to Mr. Yusuf? They just shook their head. So then they told me the story of what happened to Mr. Yusuf. And why he's no longer working. Because that wasn't like him to stop working. And guess what? He brought a girl from Nigeria, yeah? Young girl. And he brought her to Nigeria. I mean to England. To study law. So he brought her to England, or well, to London, to study law. And he's paying for all her uni fees. So while he's paying for all her uni fees, yeah? She's now graduated. So you see, when she graduated... She said to Mr. Yusuf here, yeah, I'm a lawyer now. You're not on my level. She told Mr. Yusuf, you're not on my level. Do you understand? Do you know how peak that is for a man to hear after he's paid your uni fees, after he's sponsored you for the entirety of your degree? Mr. Yusuf went mad. They told me he's an alcoholic, no? He's got a bowl in his house. He's struggling to pay rent. He might lose the house. They said he's got a bowl in his house. And he pours different kind of liquor in there. So vodka, Kavossier, Henny, rum. All into the bowl. And he mixes it and then he drinks it like soup. 
Do you know how gone you have to be to drink alcohol like soup? Different kinds of alcohol. My prayers are with Mr. Yusuf. But let this be a lesson to all of you. Meet a woman where she's at. Don't ever build a woman. Never. Unless you want to get told you're no longer on my level. Never build a woman, my brothers. Meet her how she is. And the two of you build together. And you rise together. But don't elevate her. Because when she's on your level, she's going to find someone who's higher than you to elevate her even further. So let that be a lesson. And learn from Mr. Yusuf. Like I always say, make civilian life cool again. Here's the thing. Building a woman sounds like a noble idea at first. You invest your time, effort, and resources into helping someone grow, hoping it will lead to a deeper connection and a stronger relationship. But here's the hard truth. When you're constantly building someone up, you're not in a partnership. You're taking on a project. And projects, my friend, have a way of being abandoned once they're complete. Think about it. You're teaching her skills, giving her confidence, and improving her life, essentially turning her into the woman you always envisioned. But here's the catch. Once she's built, she might decide she's too good for you. Suddenly, you're no longer the man she needs because she's looking for something better. And guess who reaps the rewards of all your hard work? Yep, the next guy. The one who gets all the benefits without lifting a finger. This isn't bitterness, it's reality. Many men have learned the hard way that building someone who doesn't appreciate the effort will only leave you drained and resentful. Relationships are supposed to be partnerships, where both people are already bringing something to the table, not one person doing all the heavy lifting while the other reaps the rewards. Instead of building someone, focus on finding someone who's already ready. Someone who's growing on their own, driven by their own ambition. Not someone who sees you as a stepping stone or a temporary teacher. This way, you're not constantly pouring out with nothing being poured back into you. It's not about being selfish or refusing to support your partner. It's about protecting yourself from being used as a free upgrade station. If you're not careful, you'll spend your best years building someone just to watch them walk away and shine for someone else. Bottom line, build yourself first, focus on your own goals, growth, and happiness. The right woman will see your value and match your energy. No construction required. So who gets to keep an engagement ring if the wedding is called off? Well, that is what the highest court in Massachusetts was asked to decide with a $70,000 ring at the center of that dispute. The court ultimately ruled last week that an engagement ring must be returned to the person who purchased it. It ended a six-decade state rule that required judges to try to identify who was to blame for the end of the relationship. Here's the thing. People fight for what isn't theirs because entitlement has become the norm, not the exception. The idea of keeping an engagement ring after calling off a wedding is a prime example of this mindset. An engagement ring isn't just a piece of jewelry, it's a symbol of a promise to marry. If that promise is broken, the symbol loses its meaning. So why would anyone feel entitled to keep it? Let's break it down. The ring is essentially a contract. If the marriage doesn't happen, the contract is null and void. Legally and morally, it should go back to the person who bought it. That's just common sense. If the roles were reversed and the man decided to keep something he didn't pay for, people would call him petty or greedy. But somehow, when it's the other way around, excuses start flying. And let's be real. If the ring were some $50 trinket, she'd toss it back without hesitation. The fact that this even went to court tells you everything you need to know. It's not about sentiment, it's about value. People will fight tooth and nail to hold on to something expensive, even when they know deep down it's not theirs to keep. At the end of the day, keeping a ring from an engagement you don't want is just bad form. It sends the message that material gain matters more than principles. And honestly, what kind of person clings to a reminder of a relationship they've already decided to walk away from? If the relationship is over, the right thing, the honorable thing, is to return the ring and move on. Unfortunately, in today's world, common sense isn't so common and entitlement reigns supreme. But anyone with even a shred of integrity knows the truth. If you break the contract, the ring goes back. Period.